Hi everybody, uh, this is Diaboli 101 and this is the first of many courses that will be offered here on Etsy. Uh, I am Martin McGregor. I have some notes here in front of me and some key things that we're going to touch on today. I recommend that you go and grab some paper, a pencil, uh, something to take some notes with because you will likely find some things that you want to follow up on uh, in your own individual study during this course. Uh, this is the 101 level course for Satanism. Uh, I will be doing many other videos uh, as far as the ethics and practice of Satanism, uh, advanced Satanism, what to do after you've got the basics and even the intermediary levels down. What do you do? Where does your path go from there? Uh, these are the types of things that we're going to be touching on in this series. And as I said, this is the 101 level of Diaboli, uh, the basics of Satanism. Uh, we're going to touch on a lot of the misconceptions, a lot of the uh, errors in logic, and just the, uh, the, the overall misinformation uh, that is spread out there about Satanism. So again, like I said, I have some notes here, uh, just some key things that we're gonna make sure we touch on, uh, and I recommend you do the same, uh, have some way of taking some notes, uh, so that you can go and follow up on the things you do find interesting uh, during this course. So, to begin with, uh, to give you a little bit of background on me personally, uh, so you know who you're talking to and who is instructing you in this course, uh, my name is Mark McGregor. I am the author of Paths to Satan. I am the author of Book of the Fallen. Uh, these are both uh, basic uh, introductory texts into uh, Satanism, uh, ranging from a primer that you can uh, use to, to introduce family and loved ones to your practice, uh, all the way to the theory, uh, ethics, and practice of your actual individual spiritual path. Uh, I am also the author of Blasphemies of the Ascendant, uh, that is found within the Deification Magic Spellbook from Become a Living God. Uh, this is a text that walks you through uh, the basics of deification magic in a satanic context. Uh, beyond that, I am also in a couple of anthologies, uh, but they're kind of lesser known works. Uh, My Name is Legion for We Are Many, that is a, a book of origin stories for people who are on the left-hand path. Uh, worth a look, uh, but also it is not much of a resource for a practicing uh, satanist. So uh, those are my written works. Uh, you can find me on the internet on many podcasts, uh, radio shows, Knights of the Nephilim, uh, Radio Wasteland. You can find me on Andre Vitimus's Deeper Down the Rabbit Hole. Uh, I used to blog quite often for demonolatry.org, uh, although I don't do much blogging nowadays. It's, it's more concerted efforts uh, of discernment. Uh, and stuff like this on Etsy, uh, helping everyone here develop their own practice, get the basics down, uh, and as we go along we'll get into the, uh, the intermediate and expert level of things as well. Um, I've been a Satanist for about 20 years. Uh, most of that was in a solitary practice, I'd say probably 12 to 15 years of that I worked alone, uh, and in the last five years I've begun to work in a group setting, uh, and I would once probably expound the individual nature of Satanism uh, and how important it is to have your own path and I think that's an important part of it uh, but once you reach a certain level you're going to want to seek out like minds like spirits uh, and people you can discuss these topics with uh, as adults on an adult level um, and that really will propel your practice forward so uh, if you already are there and you are looking for things to take you to the next level, I would start looking uh, to find a group of mature practitioners who are on your same level uh, that you can begin working with and, and discussing these, these topics as a group. Uh, we'll go into uh, a little bit more of my history here and just my reputation as far as the greater satanic community goes because as i said i am your instructor in this course and i think it's important that you know exactly who uh, you are talking to here so uh, i am an ordained uh, sacred minister of satan through universal life church 
Uh, many of you are going to be familiar with that organization. Uh, it is kind of a blanket ordainment organization. Um, as far as the greater satanic organizations, you'll find that uh, I have a little bit more of a storied past. Uh, I am persona non grata with uh, Church of Satan. Uh, I have had specific dealings with them that have led me to believe they are not a fan of me or my work. Uh, and that's fine. That's kind of a blanket position they have for most theists, which I've had absolutely no problems or qualms stating openly that I am a theist and I always have been. Um, so that along the same lines with uh, the Satanic Temple, uh, they would probably rather just treat me as though I don't exist. That's kind of how they have treated me in the past uh, because I probably present some ideas in a way that are uncomfortable to their purely atheistic nature. Uh, and that's probably true of both uh, Church of Satan and the Satanic Temple. So just so you were aware, I do not hold ordainments through either of those organizations uh, and most likely they are going to not be fans of my work if they say they are aware of it at all. We'll go into now uh, kind of more of the meat and bones of this topic. We'll get off of me here for a little bit uh, and we'll start talking about the misconceptions that uh, abound within uh, the, gr the outer world's perception of Satanism as well as the internal ideas of what Satanism is within the religion itself and its many different sects. Uh, and how many of them perpetuate misconceptions all their own uh, in the defense of their own organization or line of reasoning. So this is something that happens quite a bit um, when people are trying to justify a certain organization's stance on a particular subject. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, first and foremost, we'll get into what Satanism is not. So, Satanism is not a veneration or a worship of evil. Uh, these are things that are purely human moral uh, ideas and concepts, and they should not be applied whatsoever to spiritual beings uh, such as Satan, demons, fallen angels, regular angels, or whatever else. Um, to venerate a human concept as a worship of a greater being uh, is just missing the mark. It really is. So uh, while we may not shy away from the darker parts of human nature, it is absolutely not a veneration or a worship of the uglier, sinister, uh, violent, and quote unquote evil parts of, of our nature. Uh, that is not what it is. It's not a religion based on pain or suffering or torment or divine judgment uh, and the application of those things in the pursuit of that divine judgment. Uh, it is not, it is not a racist or exclusionary practice. This means it is not only for Gentiles. It is not against Jews. It is not, and I, and I say this specifically because there have been many organizations in the past that have tried to co-opt Satanism for those specific purposes, and it is not. Everyone in the world is a Satanist to someone else. It is the most inclusive religion in the world, and it is not a racist or exclusionary ideology in the least. Uh, it is not a quick or easy way to fame or riches or power. It can be a path to those things. It absolutely can be. It is not going to be easy. It is not going to be without work. You are going to earn everything you get. But you can get those things. The final two are a little bit more in line with just the modern state of Satanism, and I would say that Satanism is not a purely political or activist ideology. There is a faith involved in it. There is a religion tied to it, and to treat it as a purely atheist organization or um, entity within the modern scope of, of religion uh, is just missing the complete history of Satanism 
Uh, I think that it can be used as a great activist tool, and there's certainly energy of that inherent in Satanism, in transformation and changing the way things are. Uh, but to treat it as that is the main purpose of this highly complex and challenging faith uh, is just not accurate. And beyond that, the last and final point is it is not a modern invention. It is not a modern innovation, a modern religion. It dates back centuries, if not millennia. Uh, and to act as though it was a modern invention conjured up by people in the modern age is to ignore the long history of faith and religion throughout the world. Uh, so those are just some quick points on misconceptions. Uh, we'll go right into some of the history of Satanism uh, and devil worship as it would be more properly coined in the historical context. Um, we'll get right into that uh, as we go into the history and it's going to be right in line with that modern invention stuff. Um, Satanism is one of the oldest religions in the world. Uh, Satan's hand, for those who know how to identify it, has been at play and can be identified and seen in civilizations and groups and spirituality all throughout history. All throughout many cultures and many faiths, we see the hand of Satan at work. It is the religion of the other. And that is why the energy of the other, of Satan, the devil, uh, that which out, lies outside the realms of God, uh, is so inherent to Satanism. Uh, it is that. It is the religion of the other, and that's also why it is so closely tied to paganism, demonolatry, and polytheistic faiths, because it has always been a home and a safeguard of people who want to worship their own gods or become their own gods. Uh, it is a tradition and faith that dates back centuries that this is what Satanism is about. And while that may be true, it may also be true that they've used different terms for what we today consider to be Satanism. As I said before, everyone in the world is a Satanist because everyone in the world is an other to someone else in the world. And that defines all of us in the world as Satanists. Now, those of us who pick up that mantle and assume that title readily and with pride and along with everything that comes with it, we get to call ourselves something different. We get to call ourselves the actual Satanists, the real Satanists, those who actually are following in the footsteps of that God who has been present throughout history. Now, because we take up that mantle, we also have to understand that we are the religion of the other and therefore we have to defend the rights of the other. We have to defend the rights of maybe even Satanists who don't even believe in Satan. But it is still important to uphold and defend their ideas of Satanism. And also that applies to people of other faiths. We need to understand that while everybody in, uh, in the world is a Satanist, not everyone is meant to be a real Satanist. And by having those in our ranks that are not meant to truly be here, uh, the faith gets weakened and it gets polluted and diluted. And that is an important lesson to learn that we need to identify those that belong on the path and then bring them into the fold. But then we also need to identify those that need to seek their own path outside of Satanism and defend their right to do that as well. Now we'll get into another pretty big misconception here, and this is probably part of the reason why I'm not too liked in the Church of Satan, uh, and this may upset some of you that watch this today, but uh, the truth of the matter is uh, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan did not, did not invent Satanism. They may have codified it in the modern day, they may have set down some of the beginning ethics and philosophy that have defined it, but they absolutely did not invent Satanism. 
Um, and I'm going to demonstrate this on both a uh, theoretical um, standpoint of the idea of what Satanism is uh, and what it has been clearly defined uh, as in other terms throughout history, but it has existed, uh, which would negate the claim that it was a modern invention. And then I'll also give an example of an organization, uh, just one, that exhort... Uh, it, I will provide one example of an organization that existed prior to the, the Church of Satan, uh, and it took very little precursory research to find this reference. You can find many more if you do some more research on your own, uh, but we'll go, we'll go ahead and get into that. So a very popular movie uh, with Satanists and occultists would be The Ninth Gate. Uh, starring Johnny Depp, and that is a movie full of symbolism and references that we could talk about ad nauseum for a long time. Uh, but one of the things at the very beginning of the movie that will help me prove this point here is uh, Johnny Depp goes to a speech being conducted by Boris Balkan, and in that speech he references a book that gives a definition of the word witch. And I'll give some specifics here. Uh, in, in the Ninth Gate, Balkan says, in Bodine, we find one of the first definitions of the word witch. He quotes, a witch is a person who, though cognizant of the laws of God, endeavors to act through the medium of a pact with the devil. Now, this is a work of fiction, is a fictional movie, but he is actually referencing a real book. He is referencing the 1580 manuscript De la Demanomanie des Sorciers by Jean Baudin uh, on the Demon Mania of Witches is the translation of that title. De la Demanomanie des Sorciers. Uh, the actual definition in that book that Balkan is referencing in that fictional work is who by commerce with the devil has a full intention of attaining his own ends. And that probably has to be the most accurate definition of modern day Satanism I have ever heard. Uh, particularly when you take it in light of the atheistic organizations that have sprung up, such as the Satanic Temple and the Church of Satan. Uh, in their purely atheistic light, that is exactly uh, what they would be preaching, is a commerce with the devil, uh, as they see a primordial force in nature and the universe, to attaining your own ends, attaining your ends instead of the ends of, of God. Uh, and while not fully organized into a, a religion or known as the term Satanism or Satanist, they rather use the word witch, this very accurate definition of the principles and precepts of Satanism are seen in French manuscripts as early as 1580, and who knows even further back if we had better resources as far as the books that were written of the time. Um, so that is already on its face showing that these concepts, this idea of either becoming your own god or worshiping your own gods in the ends, in the, in the aim to reach your own ends, has been around for centuries, if not millennia. It is inherent to the human spirit to do so. It is why we are a part of Satan, why Satan is a part of us, and why he is a, 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 the god of this world, of this world's energy that we are a product of, that we are a natural product of. As early as the 1940s that we know of in print there were organized organizations devoted to the practice of working with Satan in this context. J.R. Lewis, uh, in his 1998 offering, The Encyclopedia of Cults, Sects, and New Religions, shares that Our Lady of Endor Coven, 
also known as Ophit Cultus Satanus, was founded by Herbert Arthur, Slo Arthur Sloan of Toledo, Ohio in 1948. It was a Gnostic organization that believed Satanism to be the oldest religion in the world, dating back to the worship of the horned god. And the cult believed that Satanism differed from modern-day Wicca or witchcraft in that it specifically retained the symbolism and meaning in spiritual practice of the horned god. Anton LaVey did codify modern Satanism by founding the Church of Satan, which was based on his teachings in the Satanic Bible, which came a little bit after the founding of the church. I will say that Anton LaVey, uh, the Satanic Bible, these were pivotal works. They were instrumental works to the creation of modern Satanism in our culture and day. The ramifications and historical importance of this cannot be understated in the Satanic context. And a lot of, of credit and due uh, respect does need to be paid to Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan for what they've done. Uh, that does not negate any of the incredibly valid criticism that may come along with that as well. The Church of Satan was co-founded by Anton LaVey and his wife Diane Hegarty uh, at the Black House in San Francisco, California on Walpurgis Knot, April 30th, 1966. This is all very common knowledge. You can look it up on Wikipedia very easily. This is just basic history of the church information. A little insight I will share from my own practice, from my own personal relationships. Um, I, I want to share with you just how instrumental I personally believe uh, Diane Hegarty really was to the creation of the, uh, the Satanic Bible. Uh, everything that is contained within it, uh, I am almost positive that she had just as big a hand in the creation of that text as Anton LaVey. Uh, I think it is just as much a work of hers as it is a work of, of, of his. Um, I, I think at least significant parts of it were of her inspiration, at the very least. Um, she was a uh, high priestess of the church for approximately 25 years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to know Stanton LaVey, uh, Anton LaVey's grandson, uh, and he was explicit about just how much of a factor Diane was in the creation of the Satanic Bible and the church itself. Uh, while I can't prove it, I really do, I, I do believe that she had just as much to do with that book as Anton LaVey did. Uh, and the Satanic Bible is dedicated uh, to her with the words for Diane. Uh, the Church of Satan was split in 1975. Uh, many original and early members, even leaders of the church, uh, left after the grotto system was dissolved. Uh, that was the church's internal uh, way of allowing people to raise through the echelons, raise through the ranks to church leadership, uh, and it was dissolved. Uh, many, uh, it was phased out of the church, and they wanted to begin to, uh, I don't want to say judge, but uh, examine their members' roles in greater society, the levels of uh, success they had reached and allow that to naturally promote them into higher ranks of the church and i am not a member of the church i believe that is the way they the, the direction things went but i could be wrong about that you'd have to speak to a, a real church official for that uh, but as far as my understanding goes that's uh, the direction the church went as opposed to the grotto system that was in place before uh, before 1975. Uh, many of those uh, members did weave to join uh, Dr. Michael Aquino's Temple of Set. He was a early church leader. Uh, I believe he reached the fifth degree in the church. I could be wrong about that as well, but I believe he reached fifth degree. Uh, and he was a fairly influential figure in the church prior to that split. Um, the Church of Satan was the first modern satanic organization to reach mainstream notoriety and they codified what it meant to be a Satanist in the 20th century. 
uh, that cannot be taken from them and that should not be taken lightly. Uh, we'll go into their, uh, the statements um, that they hold. Sorry. Okay, the nine satanic statements from Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible are Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Which is fairly straightforward. Uh, he preaches that you should indulge in the things that bring you pleasure, as opposed to abstaining from them for some desire of purity uh, and uh, better graces in the in the light of God. Um, yeah, do what you want. Do what makes you feel good. Um, bring joy into your life any way you can, uh, and don't allow spiritual dogma to keep you. Uh, from attaining the things and type of life that you want. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Exactly what I was just saying. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Uh, this is one of the major atheistic key points that many people try to point to. Uh, stop looking for spiritual remedies and things and signs that you see in the spiritual realm and rely on undefiled wisdom and I think here in the modern day we're really starting to to see just how much of an illusion that undefiled wisdom is just how untrustworthy every source is until you really get down to brass tacks and and become an expert uh, on a subject and you can't just trust any of the undefiled wisdom that people are passing to you um, so I think this is, is starting to, to show some of its age in some of these statements. Uh, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. And this is an incredibly valuable statement. Uh, you should focus your efforts on those who are being reciprocal and even those that you just simply enjoy taking care of uh, and actually appreciate it. Uh, as opposed to those who are just going to take and take and take and use you up. Uh, that is not the energy of Satan and is not the, the energy of Satanism. Uh, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. And this is one of the ones where you can hold that principle. And I think in the most egregious and important of situations, it's likely very true. Uh, but there is also value in understanding just how much of a wasted effort it can be uh, to try to fix people through your actions or get uh, senses of vengeance or righteousness through, through vengeance. Um, sometimes it's absolutely necessary and you should use your discernment and your own personal wisdom to discern the times when that's necessary. And other times, let things, let things be. Let other people destroy themselves uh, and, and leave your hand out of it, especially when there will be repercussions if you do uh, put your hands in it. Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Uh, this is, again, uh, a pretty straightforward one, even though it uses some pretty flowery language. Um, if you are responsible, more responsibility will, given, will be given to you, uh, and that is absolutely true in a satanic relationship with Satan and the demons and the fallen angels context. Um, it is often implied that this is a, you put the responsibility on where it lies and uh, not focusing on the, the psychic vampires who will spin you up into other directions just to feed off of your energy and feed off of the things that you get upset about uh, and to place the responsibility at the, at the feet of those who are responsible, but uh, particularly those of a theistic leaning who understand that we are working with these spirits in a, in a context to grow and to become better, uh, we see time and time again that those who are doing the work, those are who are who are responsible, are given more responsibility and more work to do. And those that are inactive and lazy and shirk their responsibilities will be left in a situation of stagnation and inactivity. 
and nothing will make you do anything on this path. Satan will not compel uh, you to do your duty, but he will grant you much more responsibility if you do. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who, because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development, has become the most vicious animal of all. Again, I was very honored to know Stanton LaVey, and he was a staunch vegan. He was a staunch supporter of animal rights, and I think this statement of his grandfather really struck home to him. And I think it can be true that we can be often worse and often better than the other animals of this planet. Uh, but I think it's also very true that we have become the apex of many things on this planet. And that's not hubris to, to, to say that. It is just simple truth. The advancements that we've created, the civilization that we've created, the spirituality that we've created transcends many of the other beasts that, that live on this planet, at least to our own current understanding of things. And we need to be conscious of that, and we need to foster that ability to continue to grow and advance and break ourselves down and become better, uh, because that is what created us, and that is the energy of Satan and the energy of Satanism, and to deny the fact that we are superior through our own existence in many ways, not all, is to cheapen what we are and deny the product of the satanic energy that we are. Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. I think this is a fairly blanket statement that may not really apply if you start getting into the meat and bones of things, especially when you start getting into some of those cardinal sins that really are just basic human morality, that when we start looking uh, at people in groups that want to stop being uh, at the mercy of other members of their groups uh, without some sort of organization, you start seeing these same moral codes begin to crop up in early civilization. Uh, Hammer Rabbi's code is one of the first uh, that predates the Ten Commandments, uh, even though they're pretty oddly similar, but I wonder why. Uh, Hammer Rabbi's code tends to, 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 to stray on the much more severe side of things as far as an implicit uh, punishment for the sins that are listed. Uh, whereas Christianity, the Ten Commandments, leave things much more up to the mystical uh, hand of God at the end of things that will determine uh, how bad your sins were. Finally, the last, the ninth satanic statement of the satanic Bible, Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. And this is what I say when everyone in the world is a Satanist, because uh, throughout history, tracing all the way back to the Abrahamic religions, I can't tell you if it's true of all the pagan religions. I'm sure there probably were some pagan faiths that frowned upon the, the worship of other pagan gods. I can't say that for certain, but I would almost guarantee that to be the case, or at least I can't, say, I can't give you a specific example right now. But I believe that was probably the case. And it's certainly the case in the Abrahamic faiths that came after them, where if you didn't worship our God, you were worshiping the devil, the other God, you became the devil worshiper, the Satanist. And this is the most unifying thing the world has ever seen. Everyone is a Satanist, but not everyone is a real Satanist. Keep up with a little bit of the more modern stuff here, and then we'll start getting into some of the actual more uh, general issues behind Satanism, and then how are we doing it? You know, the practical application stuff of, of what makes Satanism Satanism. So, uh, in the early and late 1990s, with the proliferation of the internet, 
the Church of Satan kind of stopped having its monopoly on satanic uh, organizations in the limelight, in the public light. Uh, there have always been minor off offshoot organizations, but you really had to do some digging to find them. Uh, and the 90s, with the internet, that totally changed. There were many organizations, you know, popping up. Like I said earlier in this video, many of them tried to co-opt Satanism for their own nefarious beliefs that had nothing to do with Satanism. So, in that time period, things began to radically shift, and the scope and breadth of what it meant to be a Satanist, or what it could mean to be a Satanist, expanded widely. Uh, and it created many new sects and organizations, though many of them did not stick or gain prominence like uh, the Satanic Temple did. Uh, the Satanic Temple was founded by Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jari, uh, and they became active in early 2013. Uh, they are a self-proclaimed non-theistic religion, religious organization uh, that mainly seeks to enact political uh, and social activism and outreach. So they have kind of taken the roots of atheistic Satanism of uh, the Church of Satan and they've kind of stripped it even more of any kind of religious um, you know, institution or organization and they have really replaced it uh, with a dogma of political activism and social activism uh, and while those are laudable things they absolutely are and I'll be the first to say the satanic temple does some important work they do a lot of the fighting uh, on the religious freedom fronts the reproductive right fronts that no one else is doing these are things that our country believes in. The United States, the majority of people in this country believes in a lot of the things the Satanic Temple does, and they're the only ones on an organized level standing up and, and fighting for them. And that's absolutely laudable, and it's something that we should be supporting them on a much wider scale for. At the same time, just as the Church of Satan has to be lauded for introducing and codifying these ideas in our modern area the satanic temple the work that they do is laudable but it does not save them from the absolutely valid criticisms that come along with the way they've run their organization and the way they've influenced satanism since their inception <laughs> they have taken ideas and principles that have been core fundamental ideas about Satanism inherent to its practice, such as the arm's reach that we treat children with, where we do not seek to influence or indoctrinate children into our faith before they are of an age where they can actually make that decision for themselves. The Satanic Temple has time and time again created resources geared specifically for children, and I understand the logic behind it in the fact that it's a response to another religion's attack on those children's freedom of growing up without being indoctrinated. I understand this, but we should do better. We should be able to address that without doing the same thing. And then when we're not doing that, when we're not addressing something specifically for them, we should not be including the children in our symbolism, in our statuary, in our marketing. We shouldn't be doing these things if we actually hold true to the satanic principles that have been in place for time immemorial. Immemorial, sorry. Um, these are things that come along with the denial of the theistic side of Satanism that just happens when you adamantly refuse to accept the lessons that have been a part of this practice for so long. And then along with that, the Satanic Temple in particular has been plagued with controversies from within in the way they run their organization and the very not Satanic way they allow people to hold their own religious and spiritual beliefs. I know of one example very recently where an ordained minister through their organization had their title stripped from them 
simply because they shared the the fact that they held theistic views and this is something that a respectable we are serious about our satanism organization should not be doing uh, and that's just one of the valid criticisms of the satanic temple so while they do a lot of great work they do a lot of questionable things as well uh, and we just have to be honest about those things if we're honestly looking and examining the state of Satanism in our world right now. Let's make sure I don't have anything else. Okay, we're going to go through um, T uh, TST, which is the moniker for the Satanic Temple. Uh, they gain notoriety through their legal and social initiatives involving abortion, separation of church and state, and religious instruction in public schools. They are headquartered at the Salem Art Gallery in Salem, Massachusetts. And as we went over the uh, satanic statements of the Church of Satan, we'll go through the, uh, the seven tenets of the satanic temple. So we have the first one. One should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. So, we've already completely abandoned any uh, idea of righteous vengeance and of being able to feel those feelings and act upon them in select instances. And we are now just saying compassion and empathy is the only way. Um, I don't know how much of a historically uh, satanic perspective that is uh, as far as being able to reach back into history and find satanic organizations and satanic thought that is in line with that tenant uh, but maybe some of you can go back and find more of a, a compassionate streak uh, than I have uh, the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions this is actually a fairly satanic damn tenant uh, let's act on our own reason beyond that that has been set down by the higher powers above, whether that be a government or an institution or an organization. Um, we're going to fight for the other. We're going to fight for those that are being othered. Yeah, that's satanic as hell. Love it. One's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. Now, this is a sticky one for them. It truly is, because this is the core foundational tenet for all of their abortion stances. They hold the female um, mother to be her right to body and uh, her, her own right to her body is inviolable. And I would agree with that. Where I would say there's more nuance and there's things that we need to th think about and talk about is where does an unborn child's inherent right to be inviolable begin? Because through even their sheer anatomy, their sheer functions of their preborn body, their will is to live. They are fighting for a life from their very inception. Even the the act of conception is a fight between reproductive systems and parts to see what will become. Will an egg become impregnated? If it is, what sperm will do it? Will that be able to take hold in a mother's womb and grow and become stronger and grow into something that will eventually become an inviolable person with their own will and if we take even the whole it's not a person or a life before it is birthed through the vaginal canal if we even take that stance what's the cost of the potential will that is present once birth has happened what have we lost through the elimination of that potential will. And I'm not making an argument either way for pro-life, pro-choice. I'm much more in line with a pro-choice line of thinking. 
But that doesn't mean, as Satanists, if we're going to think about this as a core, fundamental, satanic tenet for our organization, why are we not thinking about these things and forming a much more nuanced and balanced viewpoint beyond that of my body, my choice? Nothing in Satanism, nothing in any spirituality should be simplified to four words and that's the entirety of your argument. You have to do better. And I think as Satanists, we have a responsibility if we're going to lead this movement and lead this faith forward into the years to come, that we do better on that regard. So that's a sticky one for me, and I think it's a sticky one for them the fourth tenet, the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend, to willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. Now again, this is a sticky one for a lot of the TST congregation because they want to to use that as a justification of censorship. I've seen it happen. They want to say that that means you shouldn't be offending people and you should defend other people's freedom to the point of censoring others who are encroaching on another person's freedom. It's a catch-22. They're talking out of both sides of their mouth, and I don't think that's a very clear-cut tenant. I think they need to do better. Beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take core... Okay, I'm sorry. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's beliefs. And this is one that is actually quite... Um, it's really applicable right now. It's quite applicable. Uh, particularly after everyone coming out of the pandemic and just how quick everyone is to fit the science into their own narrative to support their own narrative. Uh, it's a good tenant and I'm not sure if it's practiced as well as it should be, but they should stick to it. And they should definitely take more light in Satanists in general. I don't mean to target this on, on TST congregation members or anybody. I'm speaking as an uh, instructor on the subject of Satanism. If we're talking about these tenets, these are things that you should be thinking about when you read them. And in this one in particular, we should be really dialing in on that one's own understanding of science and understand that we're all fallible and we all have very limited understandings of science. Even scientists are very gener or, uh, specific. They govern specific fields very often, more often than not. Uh, and even the, even the context of a scientific paper isn't to prove anything. It is to disprove or show the ability to dis disprove a null hypothesis. A hypothesis that says this is not what is capable of happening. And this paper can show that, no, we have evidence that maybe it is possible that it is happening. But it doesn't prove that, yes, this is what's happening. It's a very nuanced thing that most people don't understand about the very nature of scientific research. There are very few scientific papers that give solid answers without providing many more very murky questions. People are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. This is a good one. This is exactly what we were just talking about. Lean on your own understandings, but also be pliable. Be able to understand when you have made a mistake. It's the only way you learn. And I'll tell you what, the... the faster you stop being scared of being wrong and being more open to asking questions and not looking for a reason why somebody is wrong, but 
looking for a reason why to ask why they may be right, you'll begin to grow leaps and bounds in your own personal understanding of your own personal spiritual concepts because you'll stop seeing the unknown as a threat and you'll start seeing it as an opportunity to see how things align even more than you knew before. The last tenet. Every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. That's a really feely good tenant that I don't know if I agree with whatsoever. Yes, tenants should be guiding principles. But you can't equivocate your way straight away from the things that you're trying to use as guiding principles. If they're guiding principles, they should guide you. And this, I've always felt, is just an equivocation, a cover our own ass, this is what we are saying, but you really can do what you want kind of tenant. And it's one of the things that has led me to be reluctant to align myself with that particular organization, if they would even be willing to have me, which I don't think they are. I'm going to make sure I haven't missed any last notes here. Okay, so we've talked about the Church of Satan. We've talked about the Satanic Temple. So that you are aware of me and my allegiances and who I am. Because again, I want to inspire transparency and I want you to know who it is that is instructing you in this course. Uh, I am a co-founder of Twisted Tree Abbey. Uh, it is a closed group of practitioners. It was established in 2021, 2022 uh, to advance the zoetic alchemy of Satan, which is something that you'll be hearing much more about from me here in the near future. Uh, it is also uh, established to advance the religious doctrine of real Satanism, which I spoke about a little bit earlier. Real Satanism is an inclusive satanic uh, religious doctrine that recognizes everyone in the world as a Satanist. Uh, membership in the Abbey is currently closed. Uh, we will probably be opening the doors here in the new, near future. Uh, if you are interested in joining an organization that is open to atheists, open to theists, and understands the value in both lines of thought without feeling one is mutually exclusive over the other, uh, reach out, get in touch, and see how you can begin that process because we are opening soon. We're going to talk about some general issues here. Uh, and some of them I just mentioned. Uh, the first one is going to be, is Satanism a purely atheistic religion, which the Satanic Temple and the Church of Satan would love to have you believe? The answer is no. No. Absolutely not. People have worshipped Satan and the Horned God as an actual being long before the modern atheistic viewpoint of Satanism was established. There is a strong history and tradition of theistic practice within, within Satanism, and to say otherwise is to deny the history of the religion beyond the last 50 years. If you want to talk about the last 50 years, the mainstream organizations, they have been atheistic, they have been closed, very closed in some parts, to theists. We have not been represented in those organizations. If you want to go past the last 50 years, you'll find almost exclusively theists. Those who knew Satan was a force, an entity in nature, in the world, in the spirit world, and however you want to vocabularize it. They knew him to be real. They worked with him as a god. That is the reality of it long before the modern day. Is Satanism a purely theist religion? No. No. The hand of Satan has been seen in other faiths and in strongly anti-Satan faiths throughout history. 
the hand of Satan inspiring music and occult knowledge and magical practice and pacts with the devil and all of these spiritual practices that people would employ whenever they left the graces of God, that has been more often than not perpetuated through Christian mystics, Jewish mystics, those who were not Satanists, those who did not worship him as a god. We, our craft was advanced through those people who saw him as an enemy. So you can't say that the worship of him as a god and the worship of Satan as an entity, as a benevolent spirit and one that passes down knowledge, you know, uh, uh, willfully on the part of the recipient, that's not required. It hasn't been required since day one. Satan has shaped the, the history and the course of humanity using people closed off to him from the beginning. So that means that atheistic worship of him, atheistic representation or symbolism of Satanism is just as valid as theistic worship. Or at least it can be if it's approached with a genuine authenticity that comes along with real satanic practice. Do you have to do magic to be a Satanist? No. Uh, Satanism is spirituality uh, of self-discovery and self-actualization. For many of us, magic and ritual are a part of that self-actualization and realization. But many of us do not employ those things. Some of them, or some of us, see those as tools to help alchemize ourselves into better beings. Other Satanists feel that they do not require the use of ceremonial magical ritual or spell casting or even meditation that's not something i would you know uh espouse i think those are all important things but some satanists do not incorporate those things and their practices are just as valid as mine does believing in or worshiping satan make you a christian and this is one the internet trolls love to trot out. They love to say if you use the word Satan, if you use the term Satanist, if you believe in Satan as passed down in the Abrahamic faith, that makes you a Christian. And they're dead wrong. Uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with being a Christian or following the Christian faith. And in fact, if you wanted to get serious about it, uh, Ha Satan or Ha Satan uh, from the Jewish mystics and Jewish pre-Christian texts uh, was a character that existed long before Christianity was a thing. So to use that term, terminology, uh, vocabulary, uh, and then try to attach a Christian uh, attachment to it uh, is just plain wrong. Uh, you might have a little bit more of a basis of logic if you tried to say that you were Jewish. Uh, but again, that has absolutely nothing to do with adhering to the tenets and the principles that we just talked about that help define Satanism. Judaism, Islam, Christianity, all the Abrahamic faiths, they have their own. And following those tenets, those commandments, is what's going to dictate your allegiance and belonging to any of those organizations just like having you adhere to the tenets and beliefs of satanism is what makes you a satanist now at the core of this argument they want to talk about vocabulary and they want to talk about well satan was originated from these so that makes you x and that's just not the case and i'm going to tell you why it's because we identify with the entity that has been named that by those organizations and those religions. We know that as they were crafted, they looked upon the spiritual landscape of humanity and they identified those that came before and they identified those that stood against what they were going to try to implement in the future. And they named those entities and those gods, Satans and demons and devils. And that is why we are okay adopting that title and adopting that mantle of Satanist because we understand they were naming correctly. 
they were naming those spirits that are against everything they have built and all the spiritual suffering they have imposed on our race satan was their enemy and that's why he's our friend that's why we adopt that title because that is who we are to them we are those who would stand up against the spiritual enslavement and oppression that they have imposed in the wake of their crusades and their witch trials and their everything that's going on in our modern day country that is why we use the term it has nothing to do with adhering to their faith or the tenets of what they even believe those those entities to be it is an identification of opposition which goes back to the very original meaning of satan in those jewish mystical texts which is going to be accuser or opposer and that is exactly who he is and is exactly who we are and granted we've all grown up living in the product of those worlds and the product of the world created by the drivers of those bulldozers over the spiritual landscape and history of humanity but that doesn't change our stance on things we can do better we don't need the oppression that has been imposed upon us satan stands against that and that is why we stand with him so no being a satanist and using the term satanism satan does not make you a christian now we'll get into some basic practices some more a little bit more lighthearted. just we can actually use this to uh become satanists uh advance our satanic practice and live a satanic lifestyle we'll start getting into some more of that stuff so satanism is a multifaceted religion it can truly be whatever you want it to be with that being said there are some core principles and concepts and practices that will serve you as guideposts to keep you on the same path of satan and satanism but you will always have the ultimate determination of what your satanism means for you there are no commandments in satanism and while each organization that we've just talked about has their own guideposts and tenets the only thing that makes your satanism less than it can be is you no amount of money spent or consultations done or boot camps can be compared to daily consistent work on your behalf for your own spiritual advancement and your own personal relationship with satan fallen angels demons egyptian gods planetaries whoever you decide to fill your paradigm and your pantheon up with the work you do will be worth more than any amount of work done by anyone else on your behalf and that's a self-defeating argument by someone on etsy offering uh, spiritual services but that is the absolute truth that i can give you do the work yourself and you will see much faster results study and enlightenment are absolutely inherent to your satanic practice now whether this is study into the gods that you're working with study into satan whether it's study into skills and abilities you want to advance and learn through your satanic practice whether it is self-discovery and self-study and looking inward to see the patterns and the focuses of your own life these are all inherent things as part of your satanic practice to not do them is to ignore a big part of what is required of you even if it's something that you don't want to learn even if it's something that you don't agree with 
learn enough about it, even if it's just to turn it on its head, just to show how wrong it is. Learn the basics, learn your material, and then turn it on its head. But do the work, do the study. Advancement, transition, change, all of these things are also inherent in satanic practice. If you want things to stay the same in your life, but just get amplified, oh, I just want more, but I don't want anything to change for that to happen, Satanism is not going to be a good path for you. Because you're inherently going to be changed through the practice. And through those changes, you're going to be alchemized into a better, stronger, more capable version of yourself. But to go into it unwilling to go through those steps is to invite personal despair and disappointment and just negative, uh, a generally negative experience if you really go into any kind of occult working expecting it to be all smooth and sunshine and a beautiful experience. This isn't the side for that. These gods are going to change you if you ask. And if you put yourself in a position for that change to be rough and turbulent, then that's what it will be. But you will be changed. If you understand this and align the things in your life and in yourself to accept those changes and go through them with as little turbulence as possible, then you'll have a smoother ride and you'll get to where you want to go a lot faster. You'll find that periods of inactivity often correspond to time spent doing the same, spinning your wheels. When you're not actively working on your spirituality, you will often find that that's what you're doing in life. You're spinning your wheels, you're going through day-to-day -day motions, and you're not going anywhere faster, further, or deeper. Your spirituality will mirror this, and your life will mirror your spirituality. If you make sure that your path is active, and you're constantly working on yourself and your path, you'll notice that you're doing the same thing in your real life too. And that has real repercussions for what we call consequences. And Satanism isn't the avoidance of consequences, it's the accrual of them. And we put ourselves in a position to accrue positive consequence. Topics of personal interest are of course paramount. Let your path be your path. Study the things that interest you, sustain you, embolden you. But competent Satanists should also have a baseline of knowledge from which to pull from for inspiration and guidance. So you can't just focus on the things that interest you and then leave everything else out because you're going to miss a lot of very important lessons in what you actually care about in ignoring those things that you do not. And this is something I've been very guilty of in my own personal practice years ago, is I wouldn't spend the time to study the things that I simply wasn't interested in, and I missed out on a lot of very pertinent, useful lessons, and I would suggest that you not follow in my footsteps in that regard. So, on top of the personal interest things that you need to study, I'm going to recommend a reading list here uh, of baseline knowledge that would be a good idea for you to understand um, going forward in, in creating your own practice. Number one, the Satanic Bible. You gotta read it. You have to read it just to get uh, an idea of the modern climate of Satanism, what other people have read, what has influenced other people, and where other people's lines of thought have begun. This is one of the reasons why you can't take away the impact that Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan had on Satanism, because they have impacted almost everything that has come after them in the modern day. The Diabolican by Michael Aquino. This is an absolutely favorite personal uh, text for me. 
Uh, he was a leader in the Church of Satan. He chant. This is highly regarded amongst occult circles as a purely channeled text. This is absolutely inspired uh, by Satan and, and the demons. Uh, this is a must read on my list, and it's a very inspiring read for me. It, it really puts me in a space to want to accomplish and advance this faith. Uh, so I highly recommend it. On the more practical, magical side of things, the practical history side of things, The Complete Book of Demonolatry by Stephanie Connolly. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Uh, this is foundational material for anybody who's going to craft their own spiritual practice. Uh, you have to get that book. Uh, it gives great history. It gives hierarchies. It gives histories and sources of hierarchies. Uh, and it is just an all-around great foundational text. You have to read that one. Uh, along with that, the, the Demonolator's Book of Demonic Magic, or I do believe it's the Demonolator's Guide to de uh, Demonic Magic. Again, this is foundational magical practice material. Uh, they're both fairly thick books. You're going to want them as reference material for your own practice. Pick them up. That's also by Steph Connolly. Uh, Book of the Fallen, Satanic Theory, Ethics, and Practice by yours truly. Uh, this is exactly that. We go into satanic theory. What is the theory behind Satanism? Followed up by, closely, the ethics of Satanism. How do we employ that theory in ethical decision making and then dictate if a certain action would be considered satanic or not? And does that matter? Does Satanism have to dictate every single aspect of every decision that you make in every part of your life? Or can it be your spirituality and you can apply the satanic concepts that you understand to be satanic by their ethics? Do you apply those to any given situation in your life or not? That is what that book is about. You'll also find a lot of practical information about creating a practice, meditation, ritual, um, all of the things that you're going to encounter once you begin to actually craft a satanic practice for yourself. Uh, For Roboto the Magician by Franz Barden. This is a great pseudo-fiction, pseudo-non-fiction book. There's a little mix and match of both. Uh, and it gives a great insight into the occult world of the time periods before our modern day. Uh, this follows Franz Barden in, I believe, the 30s and 40s, uh, and you can see in a book drafted and written in that time period just how much these concepts were alive and well and well researched and well known and ubiquitous amongst certain circles to the point where this is not something that the revival of uh, trade or the implementation of the internet has been the conception of. Uh, these things were passed down, and they were passed down well. Uh, and you'll see a lot of that in Ferbato the Magician. Plus, it's a great read. Um, it's highly entertaining. Uh, and Franz Barden, just he, he had a good one with that. So I, I recommend Ferbato the Magician. Uh, also by Franz Barden is Initiation into the Magical Practice of... Or no, I'm sorry. This is Initiation into Hermetics. He also has one on the Magical Practice of Evocation. That is a much more advanced text, but... For those just getting into things, Initiation into Hermetics is a great text. It's also pretty beefy. It's going to be a little bit of a read for you. It's going to be a little bit of a complex read. But it really touches on some of the greater uh, occult and metaphysical concepts that you're going to encounter in your own practice. You're going to want to employ in your own practice. Uh, and it really is just a good guide and initiation into the principles of Hermetics, which is everything is connected, everything um, you know, impacts everything else. Uh, and that is one of the ways that hermetic magicians start playing with levers and you touch this thing to enact another. Um, and that's just a very, very, very basic, um, you know, summary of, of what you would uh, encounter in that text. So moving on, the Book of Azazel from E.A. Coetting. This is a great book. Uh, it's a fun read. It is a eye-opening read in just what occult magicians were encountering in the 2000s, 
uh, you know, early post internet age where people were grouping up, they were getting together and it gives a very eye-opening look and just what kind of group rituals were happening uh, and what people were walking into in that era when wanting to form groups based around these spiritual concepts. And it's an eye-opening read. I absolutely recommend it. Uh, Armada's Book of Beelzebub. This is a great historical text. It's from a modern author. It's a little bit of a shorter read, but it is highly worth the buy. Uh, you get some great insight into some more of the historical remorse uh, and the historical manuscripts that have based occult thinking and practice in the modern world. Uh, she makes a lot of really great connections uh, and gives some traditional magical, uh, you know, recipes and, and methods that are employed in some of the older grimoires. So that's a great book. You have to pick it up. Uh, Practical Sigil Magic by Freighter UD. Absolutely pivotal. If you want to learn sigil magic, anything about sigils, making them, uh, you can buy my Blasphemies of the Ascendant if you want uh, a look more specifically on the Fallen Angel side of things. But sigil magic in general, sigil creation, Freighter UD, Practical Sigil Magic, there is not a better book. Buy it. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Anything at all by Bill Duvendak. Tarot, Astrology, uh, Luciferian Connections, uh, anything by Bill Duvendak is a good buy. Uh, highly recommended if you need readings and tarot, chart readings for astrology. He is a professional magician. He is a multiple time author, presents in all kinds of areas and, uh, and events, and his books are highly worth a buy uh, regardless of your practice. Uh, if you want a source on any of those subjects, reach out and, and get a, a Bill Duvendoff book. Uh, anything by Edgar Kerbal, particularly if you are in the Latin world and looking for uh, Latin-facing materials in Spanish, Edgar Kerbal is your singular source. Get his stuff immediately. He is such an authentic magician and shaman. Uh, I mean, it drips from him. You know the energy he's working with when you see him. Uh, and I highly recommend anything he has written. Uh, and again, one last anything by recommendation, recommendation is Michael Ford. Uh, you have to pick up the stuff that he has written. These people have absolutely contributed to the occult realm in our modern day. Uh, and anything they write is worth a look. So look into them. If you are looking into some more of the historical context of some of these stories and, and parables, uh, I have two titles for you. They are a little bit more controversial. They've had movements and stances uh, kind of centered around them that are a little bit controversial, like I said. Uh, the first is The Lost Book of Enki. Uh, this is by I'm, uh, Zachariah Sitchin, and it gives a much different look into the biblical flood of Noah, how it could have actually happened, uh, and all of the, uh, the creatures and, and uh, animals of the earth actually being preserved through that uh, in a much more scientific way. Uh, way, even though the source of this book is supposedly Sumerian tablets. Uh, it is a controversial work. Uh, Sitchin used some different translations for certain words that aren't commonly accepted amongst the field. So that has caused some people to, you know, doubt the validity of his work. I'm trying to give you the full context to understand why there is controversy around his work. But if you want an interesting read that shines a completely different light on that particular event, I would look into The Lost, the Lost Book of Inky by Zachariah Sitchin. Uh, along the same lines, you can go way further back to the Book of Enoch, which is a um, Jewish mystical pre-Christian text. It is a pseudepigrapha, so it was attributed and named to Noah, or uh, I'm sorry, to Enoch, who was Noah's great-grandfather, uh, but he did not have a hand in writing any of it. 
Uh, no book was written by Enoch, um, and it all was written past when he would have been alive. Uh, and it also goes into the biblical flood, what caused it, and more specifically, the fallen angels, and the story behind the fallen angels, why they fell, uh, all that stuff. And very interestingly, the translations of that text, the book of Enoch, we can actually trace where the Jewish mystical uh, Gregory story of the fallen angels gets transitioned into the Adamic storyline revolving around Adam and Eve uh, and their uh, essentially the fallen angels prideful refusal to kneel before Adam the creation of God is what creates uh, their fall in the Adamic storyline while in the Jewish storyline and the mysticism that predates Christianity uh, it is the knowledge transfer and the relationship that the fallen angels uh, created with humanity that is what caused God to flood the entire earth. Uh, so even in that one story, the translations between times, it was specifically the uh, Slavic translations from Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek uh, into the Slavic lang languages that shows this, this shift uh, to the more Adamic storyline. Uh, so th that's also the last one I would recommend for reading uh, if you're interested in going that far back. Uh, we're going to start getting into the actual practice of Satanism. How do we actually uh, begin and sustain a Satanic practice? So um, the first thing you would do is establish a personal paradigm. You're going to decide which gods are sacred to you and which ones you're going to worship and work with. Um, you know, on a, on a spiritual basis. And this isn't a denial of the existence of other gods, it's simply an acknowledgement that these are the ones that are gonna be part of your paradigm. Uh, it's completely up to you uh, what, go, what gods you choose to worship, and that includes Satan. Now, if you don't wanna work with Satan, I don't know what much point there is to being a Satanist beyond uh, some of the other tenets or core principles that you may find, uh, you know, applicable to your life or, you know, honorable that you'd want to engender in the world. But if, uh, my own personal belief is if you don't want to work with Satan, there isn't much point in being a Satanist. But that doesn't limit you from working with any other God that you wish to work with uh, beyond maybe those that have been directly against and aligned, you know, against what Satan represents throughout history. You can seek as many spirits and gods and demons that you want to work with. It could be one or 100. It is honestly up to you. You probably want to establish an altar and a temple space to begin making those spirits sacred in your life. And that goes right along with ritual and basically anything you make a part of your spiritual practice. The things that you do time and time again with intention and mindfulness become ritual for you. They become what is sacred, the sacred steps you take in the path of your spirituality. And as Satanists, we get to dictate all of that. None of it is forced upon us. And that is one of the, the, the greatest freedoms that we're given in Satanism. I would argue that meditation is one of the most important parts of a real satanic practice. Even if you aren't employing it for magical ends or ritual ends, meditation does so much for you and it doesn't take a whole lot. It clears and focuses the mind. It improves mental and emotional states. It gives you time to decompress adjust yourself and focus on yourself and your thoughts even if you're not employing any other occult or meditative techniques simply sitting and quieting your mind and, and focusing on yourself can have great benefit and that's why even if you aren't going to employ a magical or a ceremonial ritual, ritual practice in your satanism meditation should still be strongly considered it keeps space open 
for their daily spiritual connection, contact, and influence. If you are a theist and you believe these spirits are real and you're influencing and interacting with them, you need to make time for that. And meditation is one of those opportunities. It gives you a predetermined amount of time for you to stop doing anything else and focus on your spirituality. It can be as simple as clearing your mind, and it can be as complex as Egyptian Merkaba breathing techniques and pyramids of power or astral projection and levitation and all the things that are associated with super high-level meditative techniques that only gurus and masters are capable of achieving. Find out what is important to you and effective for you in your spiritual life and then become or uh, establish a practice of those things. And no one's going to be able to do it for you. These are things that you have to do for yourself. Magicians and ritualists should employ a systematic method and approach of meditation to aid them in strengthening their magical and ritual undertakings. Meditation will offer you the tools to make everything else that much stronger. If you are going to employ those types of techniques and elements in your spiritual practice, your meditation learning journey should start with void, you should be clearing your mind, you should be clearing a, a template and a canvas for everything else that's going to come further through further visualizations and, and magical practice. You should then learn how to visualize. You should learn visualizations and working through detail of scenarios and programming energy through visualization. You need to work on that actively before you start trying to employ it in greater workings. After that, you begin working on immersion. It's not just a visualization of it. You're walking in it. You're smelling it. You're tasting it. Everything about that visualization is visceral. You are immersed in that visualization to a point where it is real. And that's where real power starts to become. Once you are immersible in a visualization, then you can start really opening your chakras. You can begin actually feeling the influence that they have as you speed them up and you unlock them and you make them more powerful and you strengthen them because chakras are your spiritual muscles. They're what actually allows you to emit the types of energy that you want to emit to program and then direct in the final thing you should work on, which is active spell casting, active ritual work. You ramp up those chakras, those spiritual muscles, and then you walk into the spell, you walk into the ritual chamber, that much more powerful, that much more capable. This is why we take a systematic approach of learning these skills before trying to utilize them but that is also highly centered around a practice that's going to employ magic and ritual as part of your daily, daily spiritual life. And ritual is one of the last things we're gonna touch on. Whether it's daily or on some other schedule, ritual is often, is often a very big part of satanic practice. And again, it's because it gives you an opportunity to set aside time for commune and communication and intuition and influence to be handed down to you by your spirit guides. Occultists and magicians will inherently see the value in establishing a ritual practice. They already see the opportunities to enact your will and also do exactly what I just said is receive and communicate with those spirits that you are working with. Like meditation, it does exactly that, 
even for people who aren't going to employ magical or quote unquote supernatural methods in their spiritual life. If you're an atheistic Satanist, there's still value in you developing a ritual practice in your spiritual life. Do the Japanese tea ceremony. Do any other set, rigid practice of using specific tools for a specific purpose to get a specific result with a quantifiable end goal. Did you accomplish that ritual better today than you did yesterday? Were you focusing more? Were you able to get so in tune with yourself and your own focus that you committed to every single one of those acts with a perfection that engendered a divine result? You can go after that without any kind of theistic belief in anything at all. And it will absolutely propel your spirituality and your just sheer personal power to levels you've never even imagined just by leaving that opportunity open for yourself to learn from that experience. Ritual is so important. Ritual can also be just like meditation in that it can be remarkably simple or incomprehensibly complex. It can be lighting a single candle to stepping through literal columns of fire. And it is once again completely up to you to decide what type of ritual you're going to employ in your own practice. The most effective conduit for direct commune and interaction with Satan, fallen angels, and demons is ritual. Consistent, relied upon, steady ritual work will get you where you want to be as far as communication and connection with spirits. As long as you're doing so honestly, and earnestly, and most importantly, honest with yourself about what you're trying to get out of it. Because you can ask these spirits for things that you think you want and you won't get them, but if you ask them for something you really do, watch what happens. The, the, the problem with that is identifying what it is you are actually after when you're beseeching these spirits for whatever it is you're beseeching them for. Are you actually going after what you want or are you going after what you think you want? And the answer to that isn't what you think it is a lot of the time. Action. Action is the number one thing you can do on your spiritual practice as far as Satanism goes. Inaction and stagnation is exactly what you will get if you do not keep up with your spiritual practice as a Satanist. Nothing is going to be compelled. You're not going to be punished in this life or the next if you don't do the things that you probably know you should be doing. But you're also not going to get the benefit. You're not going to have that life full of interaction and spiritual communication and magic that you want if you are not doing the work, if you are not putting in the time, and you're not making it a priority to do so. Action is what they want to see. And if you are not being active, they will leave you be. The highest form of Satanism is taking that action in a way that inspires others to do the same to become a Satan for others. For them to look at you and what you're saying and what you're doing and that inspire them to go and seek out their own way of doing exactly that for themselves. No amount of supplication or devotion or flowery language in front of the altar will amount to you taking on that mantle and acting as that Satan for another person. You assume the mastery and that title when you are ready. Along with everything that comes with that, you can't pick and choose. You can't take the positive parts of being called a Satan and then leave 
the negative or uncomfortable bits that make you feel like it isn't all flowers and sunshine because it isn't. You have to take it all. But if you do, then you can influence the world of others as a Satan. There's no easy way, there's no quick paths. Satan cannot bestow that title upon you. Other people have to see it in you and recognize it. And often it requires those within your circle and those without to recognize you as one for you to really become a Satan and accept that title in full. And the final note, um, I've already kind of touched on it. Reverence and supplication and loyalty and devotion are all important aspects of being a Satanist. But understand that they are just as much about you and how you feel about the situation and about how you feel about your Satanism as it is for Satan. We've already discussed that he will work through those who don't even acknowledge his presence or acknowledge it and despise his existence. So being supplicatory, having so much devotion that your heart explodes with love for him, that's great. It's not going to amount to the same as doing the work, advancing the craft, and helping others do the same for themselves. So when you craft your practice, understand what you are doing when you are being supplicatory, when you are being devotional, when you are showing loyalty. Understand that you are doing that for you as much as you are for them. Let that feed you and understand that that want is within you and that says something about you. But understand that that isn't going to get your wishes fulfilled. It isn't going to make things any better in your life just because you feel that loyalty and you display it. You are going to be expected to do the work. And that is the singular most important point that I wanted to share with you in this basics of Satanism course. And that's why I ended on this note. I have been highly loyal and my fidelity is eternal to these beings, but only through my concerted efforts of work, both spiritual and material for myself and for others, is what has advanced my craft and my path more than anything else I have ever done. With that, I am Martin McGregor. This has been Diaboli 101. I hope you truly enjoyed it. I hope you've gotten a lot of useful information out of it that helps you begin to uh, plan out and determine what would be the best satanic path for you. I appreciate you uh, tuning in, and I hope to see you again soon.